extrusion as a means of forming soft materials has been used by nature for millions of years to produce cocoons and webs. In modern times, man has copied nature. The dispensing of ice cream is a typical example. In industry, the softer metals can be extruded, particularly if they are first made ductile by heating, as on this fielding extrusion press. They can then be reduced in cross-section and formed into either solid or hollow sections. The extension of the technique to harder materials has been limited by the need for higher pressures and consequently for very strong dye. The pressure required is considerably increased by the upsetting of the billet as soon as the first pressure is applied, which causes friction between the billet and the walls of the container. This, of course, is additional to the friction which takes place in the dye. In 1893, the possibility of using hydrostatic instead of mechanical pressure was realized by James Robertson working in his Manchester office. But development of his patent was inhibited by the lack of high strength materials and it is only since the war that widespread activity has begun. This film deals with the work jointly undertaken by Fielding and Platt Limited and the United Kingdom Atomic Energy Authority. An important advantage of hydrostatic extrusion over the conventional method is that because the hydrostatic fluid applies pressure over the whole surface of the billet, no upsetting takes place and there is no contact between the billet and the walls of the container and therefore no frictional force between them. It will be noticed that a conical die is used in place of the flat die normal in conventional extrusion. The effect of the reduction in friction on the extrusion pressure required is shown on the idealized graph, which also illustrates the relationship between length of billet and frictional force in conventional extrusion, in which the longer the billet, the higher the initial peak pressure required. The main purpose of the authority laboratories at Springfield is the development of reactor fuel elements, and their interest in hydrostatic extrusion arose because of its potential application to the production of the fuel containers, commonly called cans. The early work was carried out on a vertical 300-ton press, which, though not particularly suitable, was readily available. With the die in position, the billet is loaded into the extrusion chamber. The hydrostatic fluid, which has a castor oil base, is poured in. A seal is fitted to the ram to prevent the escape of the oil, in contrast to conventional machines in which an oil-tight fit is not required. The ram is slowly lowered to enter the container. Before the pressure begins to rise, the doors are closed for safety reasons. This shows how the ram travels during the extrusion, but of course the doors remain closed during actual operation. To extend the work, a more versatile machine was needed. Close cooperation between Fielding and Platt Limited and the Atomic Energy Authority resulted in the design and building of a 200-ton machine in which the shortcomings of the original press were largely eliminated. A ram working in a vertical cylinder provides the pressure which is transmitted to the hydrostatic fluid, forcing it through the orifice at the base of the cylinder into the extrusion chamber. Here it acts on all surfaces of the billet 
and extrudes it horizontally through the die. The separation of the pressurizing chamber from the extrusion containment confers considerable flexibility in the design of equipment and in the convenience of operation. To prepare for an extrusion, the die is locked in place. The billet is inserted through the rear end of the extrusion chamber. The breech block type of closure is locked and a safety guard is fixed in place. From time to time, the reservoir has to be topped up with fluid. The ram is inched down until the pressure starts to rise. The operation of the press is controlled from the desk. When the pressure reaches a point related to the yield strength of the material, metal begins to flow through the die. One hazard of simple hydrostatic extrusion is complete ejection of the billet. This can be completely eliminated by billet augmented extrusion. In this system, the hydrostatic pressure alone is insufficient to force the material through the die and it needs to be augmented by direct pressure of the ram on the end of the billet to achieve extrusion. By stopping the ram short of the die, complete extrusion of the billet is prevented. This comparison between simple and augmented extrusion shows that higher extrusion ratios can be achieved with the latter process for the same material at a given pressure. An alternative method of augmenting is to assist the extrusion by applying tension to the extruded product. This is called hydrostatic drawing. It has been used on the 200 ton machine in the production of hollow tubes. In place of the simple run-out table to collect the product, a draw bench is installed. The limit switches which control the movement of the draw bench are carefully checked before each different extrusion. The mandrel is assembled, lubricated, and inserted in the hollow billet. The end of the billet is reduced in diameter, enabling the start of the extrusion to be carried out by simple hydrostatic pressure. The complete assembly is loaded into the extrusion chamber. With all preparations complete, the safety door is shut and the pressure applied. The ram moves swiftly down the first part of its travel and the tag of the tube formed from the thinner part of the billet is extruded. The draw bench is brought up and attached to the tag and with the aid of the pull by the draw bench, the remainder of the billet is extruded. The limit switch automatically stops the draw bench before the end of the billet has reached the die. Recent development, however, has made it possible with safety 
to achieve complete exclusion of the billet in certain applications, so eliminating entirely the normal discard. If an attempt is made to extrude a brittle material, it may fragment as it emerges from the dye. This can be overcome in many instances by attaching a receiving chamber filled with fluid at a rather lower pressure into which the extrusion is fed. This method, known as differential pressure extrusion, will often prevent the breakup of the product. There is the disadvantage that the extrusion pressure has to be increased by the amount of the pressure in the receiving chamber. A further development to be examined was the semi-continuous extrusion of rigid bar and the prototype rig was fitted to the existing machine. Up to now, the length of billet has been limited. This in turn sets a limit to the continuous length of product which can be achieved at a given extrusion ratio. With hydrostatic extrusion, however, it is possible to use an extremely long billet which passes through the ram and can be extruded intermittently to produce a single length of bar. Attached to the front of the ram is a clamp which will automatically grip the billet when hydrostatic pressure is applied. There are two separate pressure systems. High pressure is applied through the pipe bay to the oil filling the main chamber, the two ends being connected by a pipe through the ram. A low pressure system fed through the pipe B is confined to the annular space between the front part of the ram and the wider part of the chamber. The clamp is enclosed in a rubber sleeve which forms an oil-tight seal on the billet. This sleeve and the rearward extension of the ram prevent the escape of oil through the gap round the billet. To start an extrusion, oil is pumped in at A. The clamp grips the billet and ram and billet move forward. The oil in the annulus is expelled at B. At the end of the strip, the oil pressure is released, the clamp retracts, oil is pumped in at B, returning the ram to its original position. The rubber sleeve is drawn along the surface of the billet, maintaining the oil seal. The cycle is then repeated by again raising the pressure at A, and a further length of billet is extruded. From the experience gained on the prototype, a 330-ton machine was designed. The long billet extends to the right, and the motion of the ram can be seen as each cycle of extrusion takes place. This process, however, increases the number of stress cycles to which the container vessel is subjected, and raises questions of the safe lifetime of the container. In the absence of useful experience from conventional extrusion vessels, Springfields are undertaking a program of accelerated fatigue tests in order to establish the life expectancy, and therefore the economics, of hydrostatic extrusion containers. The tests are carried out on small pressure vessels made of the same material as the containers and dimensionally similar to them. The vessels are subjected to stress cycles equivalent in severity to those which the containers will meet in service. Meanwhile, to project the development work to an industrial scale, a further collaborative effort has produced a 1,600-ton press, which is in operation at Springfield. It is available to potential commercial users to investigate the applications of hydrostatic extrusion as a solution to their individual metal-forming problems. Four-inch diameter billets are used of a weight which permits manual handling, though, of course, in a commercial installation, they would be manipulated mechanically. In the case of aluminium, billets have to be immersed in a tank of lubricant and allowed to drain, although this is not necessary for all metals.
after treatment, they are loaded on a pallet and delivered to the press. pressures involved demand safety measures including warning lights on the control desk, the machine and the entrance to the press room. The operator can then start the pumps. These are located above the press. The first step in carrying out an extrusion is to set the die in place on its carriage. A billet is then delivered to the loader, which picks it up and aligns it with the die. The die is moved from the left on its carriage and located round the nose of the billet. The billet container and augmenting ram move from the right over the end of the billet. The loader jaws are retracted and the assembly with the billet inside is positioned against the end housing. A recorder provides a pressure trace as the extrusion proceeds. And the product emerges from the die. During the extrusion, the ram moves forward. Because the press is being used for a variety of products, no automatic extrusion handling equipment has been fitted, as would be normal if it were operating on a production run. At the end of the extrusion, the ram and billet container are retracted ready for the next cycle. The end of the extrusion is still attached through the die to the discard, the unextruded stub of the billet, which is gripped by jaws. Another pair of jaws grips the product and a circular saw cuts the bar between the jaws. The press is now ready to repeat the cycle, with the new die being fitted to the carriage. A television camera gives the operator a view of parts of the press not otherwise visible from the control desk. A monitor screen is also provided in an adjacent office. which can apply a pressure of up to 80 tons per square inch, will meet many industrial requirements using cold extrusion, and its capability can be extended in using harder materials by warming the billets before extrusion. An advantage of cold extrusion, apart from its greater simplicity, is the high accuracy which can be achieved. Dimensional variations amounting to only a few ten thousandths of an inch over the length of an extrusion. In addition to this high standard of accuracy, the lubricating action of the pressurizing fluid 
ensures a very smooth surface finish to the extrusion. For commercial applications, the automatic operation of the press would be extended to include billet and product handling. The machine is also capable of differential pressure extrusion to meet a particular requirement and can be fitted with tool sets to operate at higher pressures. This work is complementary to that being carried out at other British establishments, including the National Engineering Laboratory and Imperial College. The versatility available through the range of hydrostatic extrusion techniques is illustrated in these typical examples of products formed from four-inch billets. There is no doubt that an increasing number of uses will be found in the future as the industrial applications of the present development work are more widely appreciated and as further refinements are introduced. Many firms who have problems in extruding difficult materials or who require products with good surface finish and high dimensional accuracy will find their solution in hydrostatic extrusion.